once again, before we begin, as I get everything set up, so find somebody who you haven't talked to yet on some side of you, so I think you've probably got you know, one more week. Say hello to them, introduce yourselves, make some new friends. There we go. Okay. Hello, 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 hello. Shh. Shh. It's more effective if I look at my feet. Cool. So, hello again, everybody. I hope you've had a good roughly 24 hours since you saw me last. Um, welcome back to another exciting COP1511 lecture. Um, and this week, by this week I mean today, um, lecture number three, so the fourth lecture, we'll be looking at functions. So uh, I started out last time with like an overview of what we were going to do during the lecture. Did anyone find that helpful? Kind of seeing in advance what we were going to do? Did anybody find it like not helpful and you hate it and you don't want me to do it? OK, that's good. So I've written one for today as well. So we're going to be looking at some more if statements. So you should be able to do some slightly more complex situations with if statements. Then we're going to look at functions. So you should understand what a function is, why we use them, and how to make simple ones yourself. Um, and I've put sort of like a note down the bottom here. Like you, you won't be able to do these from just watching today. You need to practice yourself and all of that. So this is the foundations that you will need to do these things. Cool. So some brief admin stuff. Don't panic. How many of you are panicking at this point? Uni is hard and scary, and the course is hard and scary, and everyone's really smart, and you feel like you can't do anything. Oh, not too many of you. So, you know, it's, it's week two. Things will get better. Don't panic. I'll leave it at that for now. Lecture recordings are on the course website. Shh. Again, very, very, very important. Make sure you get home computing set up, so VLAB or something you can use at home. Make sure you can send and receive uni emails. If you can't get emails from us, then you can't know what's going on. Um, and then a fourth thing, I said last week that the labs were due on Sunday night, and the website said Saturday night, and we were confused. It turns out that they are due on Sunday the 11th of March, not Sunday the 10th of March. So I fixed it up. It was meant to be Sunday, but the number was wrong. So they are due Sunday 11.59 p.m. and 11.59 seconds afterwards. You should work on the labs after the lab if you haven't finished them, and you can submit them at any point. You can submit multiple times. So all those good things. Cool. So I have a blank review slide this time. I think with the if statement stuff we're going to do next, probably that's enough to review if statements and so on. But if you have any questions as we go, raise your hand, yell out something. And so I have prepared a demo on more if statements. Let me once again open VLAB. That didn't go so well. Uh, OK. So that's how not to use VLAB. And this is how to actually use VLAB. Cool. So once again, open your terminal with this button, or this one to get big words. Make that a bit smaller. Uh, lecture three. <coughs> Let's try that again. Shh. Okay. Super exciting stuff, guys. I'm navigating directories. So, OK, interesting stuff starts now. Please be quiet. Are you all talking because there's like something more interesting that you want to talk about? Do you want to have a few minutes to talk about interesting things and then pay attention, or we can do that in the break? Like, If you're talking while I'm talking, it's really hard for me to hear you guys, you to hear me, you to hear each other. So if you need to talk on a break, we can have a break. You can talk, but please pay attention. So I have. Before I actually get to this code, let's not look at that file yet. So we looked last time at driving age. So looking at, are you old enough to drive? So you know, if you're more than 16, then you can drive. And if you're 
Is that the microphone making weird feedback? Is that less weird feedback? Um, so if you were more than 16 and less than 120, you could drive, and otherwise you couldn't drive. But let's look at a, like a slightly more interesting and slightly more complex problem of speed limits. So driving age, we've sort of just got like a yes or no, you know, are you this age, like are you old enough, yes or no. With, we kind of added in the age thing to make it more interesting, but that's really contrived. But speed limits, however, how many of you like have a driver's license in New South Wales, like a learner's or a permit one or something? Those of you who don't, do you know how the system works? Maybe, maybe not. So correct me if I'm wrong, because I mean, I don't have a license. But my understanding is that you start out with your learner's license. Um, and you have to have somebody else drive with you at all times. You can't drive alone. Um, and you can't drive more than 80 kilometers per hour. And if they've changed that rule, let's pretend they haven't changed that rule for the sake of this. Um, then when you finish your learners, you get your like provisional one license. You can't drive more than 90. And then when you finish that, that's your red peas. And then you can get your second provisional license. You can't drive more than 100 kilometers an hour. And then when you finish, like you pass the test and stuff, you can get your full license. And then you can drive as fast as you want as long as you're within the speed limit. I'll just write fast. Cool. And so this is, this is a sort of like a situation that we can Shh. Come on, if it's really this boring, like go home. It's, it's fine. Play, pay attention, please. So this is a situation that we can represent using if statements that are sort of slightly more interesting than the ones we've seen before. I'd like to start out by drawing one of those control flow diagrams that we've looked at. So the example one for the driving age thing was something like, oh, I forgot to record this. Um, you know, if age is less than 16, you can't drive, otherwise you can drive. Right, so this sort of, do you understand what I mean by the scribble drawing in relation to what I did last week? So this, when I say control flow diagram, you know what I mean? Cool, does anyone not know what I mean and wants me to explain again? Nobody. Okay, so let's start out by you and sort of the person next to you. Get a piece of paper or something if you have paper. Um, I hope you have paper. And try and work out what would a control flow diagram for this look like. So if you're on your learners, you can go no more than 80. If you're on your P1, you can go no more than 90. On your P2, you can go no more than 100, and so on. And I have those rules written out here for you. Okay, hello again. Shh. So that was enough time for me to write mine, so hopefully that was enough time for you to write yours. Does anybody want to like bring those up and I can put it on the thing to show us the diagram they've got? Any volunteers? Are you volunteering yourself? Okay, any volunteers? You're a volunteer? Excellent. Um, so in theory, if I push this button here, and then I turn this thing on, and you put your paper here, we can see it. My writing's really messy. Sorry. It's turning on, maybe. OK. Turn it sideways. Cool. Uh, that's sort of all in view, right? Yeah. Cool. So, what is your name? I'm George. George. Okay. So, um, George, do you want to walk us through your diagram you've got? All right. Uh, I did a, a, a flow chart diagram. Uh, so, I've taken the inputs of speed and the license time. 
then we then we've done a decision on the license. If it's a learner's license, it checks the speed is less than 80. The speed being less than 80 is um, uh, in that case. Push it up a little bit more. A, um, a valid or a, a legal position. It depends on that. Yeah, so no. It's a legal position, uh, and that's fine. Otherwise, I didn't finish drawing it. Uh, it would go to uh, being an illegal position for P1 is a decision less than 90, P2 decision less than 100, and the full license is the default position, so anything goes. Cool. So the way you've structured it is sort of you look for the license type and then you check what the speed is. Yes. Cool. Who else has structured those like that? They've sort of started with the license type and then checked for the speed. A couple of you. Cool. Um, you can sit down now if you want, George. Thank you for that. Um, people who didn't start with the license type, how did you do it? Like, what did your diagram sort of look like? Anyone? Any ideas? So, those of you who drew your, di like your flow control diagrams didn't check, first of all, the license type, what did you check first? If they had license at all. That's a good question, and that's not one that I thought of putting in the question. Which is a very good point, because I don't have a license, so I don't work in here. But then also, I wouldn't be driving, so... That is a very good thought, though. Um, but after you checked if they had a license or not, what did you then do next? Okay, so then you asked for the age and then said whether they could or couldn't get one. Cool. Where did you go after that? Um, and then, like, if they did have a license, I asked whether they had a license. Yep, okay, and then so if they did have a license, then you looked at the license type and then the speed. Cool. Did anyone do it in a different approach? Yes. Cool, so yeah, you did it a similar way. I've totally forgotten the very first thing you said now that you've said all the things. But you sort of looked at if they have this license or better. Did you say? Yeah. And then check the next one. Yeah, and then check the next one along. Cool. Did anybody do it in a different way? Did anybody start with the speed first and then check the licenses? Only me? Well, that's the way that I did it. I'll put it up on the thing. my laptop. Okay, if it's going to load. Cool, so here's mine, and thanks to the wonders of modern technology, I can just zoom in. So, I started out by checking if the speed, was, the speed that you were driving at was more than 80. Uh, and if it's not, I sort of assumed the speed limit was like infinity. So, if you weren't going more than 80, then you're all good. Um, but if you were going more than 80, I then checked if you had a learner's license. So if you did have a learner's license and you were going more than 80, then you get arrested. Otherwise, if you don't have a license, if your speed is more than 90, um, then go and check if they have a P1 license. If they do have a P1 license, then they're arrested. If they don't, then they're real good. Um, and then, sorry, if their speed is, more than, is not more than 90, they're real good. This one here. Can you, oh, you can't see with the cursor. I'll grab a highlighter. Um, can you see that color? Um, so yeah, I checked if their speed was more than 90. And if it was, I checked if they had a license. And if not, their speed was all good. And then continued down, checked if their speed was more than 100. If it, and then checked if they had a P2 license. If they did arrest it, if they didn't, all good. And so it's sort of this tree overall. I have no idea how much of that you can read, but that's sort of checking the speed, and then the speed, and then the speed, and then the licenses after that. Cool. So 
Does that make sense doing it that way? Does it make sense doing it the other way around? Do you think they're both valid solutions? Like, would they both work? Seeing a lot of nods, is that because you think just George is fantastic and I'm fantastic and nothing could be wrong? Um, you, can, you can sort of get a sense, right, for even though the, the logical flow, the logical process I've got here is sort of the opposite to George's, um, they still both convincingly look correct, right? And it turns out there are many, many, many different ways you can represent the same situation and if statements and else statements and so on to still get the right answer at the end. And so what we should do next, I reckon, is try coding this up. How many of you did end up making a diagram or now understand from my diagram what's going on? So either you have a diagram or mine one makes sense to you. OK, not everybody. So maybe we'll code it up together then. Um, if you have your own diagram and you want to try coding up your own diagram, then do that now. And if you don't, then have a look at mine. Is it OK, by the way? People on that side of this, the lecture theater, can you see that screen OK? Like, do you need it to have it on both screens, or is it good? No complaints. A couple of thumbs up. Awesome. So um, I've set up some printf scanner stuff. We can look at that in a minute. But before we look at that, let's do the actual coding. So we can assume at this point we have um, our int license and int speed. So I'll just chuck this down here. Cool. And then afterwards, we can look at the printf scanf. So looking at um, the, the diagram that I've got over here, my first question is, like, is the speed more than 80? And so I can write that if speed is more than 80. Yes. Put the coding on the other screen as well. If I made the font bigger or something, would that work? It'd be really good if I could somehow show the diagram as well, or like half the diagram and half the code. Um, how about? Okay, I have got the diagram sort of displaying. Shh. Sort of displaying. It's nowhere near as nice as the tablet, but we'll, we'll live with it. So thinking back to it a few minutes ago, um, we were looking at how do we turn this diagram into code? And hopefully some of you were thinking about how could the different diagrams be equivalent or something else interesting. So in our diagram, we start out with like speed is greater than 80. And so if it's a yes, what does that mean? Like if this thing is true, then do this thing here. How do we sort of do that in code? Like, we've got if this condition, then where does the this thing here go in terms of our like a if statement or our code? Any ideas? I'll shrink that down a bit. So your choices are it could go here. Um, I could have an else and it could go here. Or it could go here. Oh, here. One, two, three. So we've got our speed is greater than 80. Yes, it is. Do this stuff over here. Is that going to go in the thing one, two, or three? Which spot? Cool. A couple of people said one. Yep. And so, like, the structure of the if statement, we have if this thing is true, then do the stuff inside the curly brackets. So in this case, the stuff inside the curly brackets is all of this thing on the right-hand side here. So we have another check that we're doing in here. So our next sort of thing we're going to look at is, is the license a learner's license? And so we can just put that inside our if statement. Uh, if license. And so then again, the yes thing that we have down here is going to go inside this, the body of the if statement. Rested. Cool. And so then, looking at this, when we have the no branch, where's that going to go in our code? Like we have if this thing is true, then inside the brackets do this arrested thing. If it's not true, like if it's going to be this bit here, whereabouts does that then go in our code? Any ideas? Hmm. 
So if the thing is true, then we do this. If it's not true, then what do we do in our code? Yeah, someone said else. Post something at the back. What, what do you think? Um, yes, so the stuff that's the not true stuff here, the speed is over 90 and so on, is going to go in the else. Cool. And so like, when we have the yes, that becomes the body inside. We call this thing here the body, the stuff inside the if statement. If it's a no, then it becomes an else. So then uh, if speed is greater than 90, um, oops. If it's a yes, then what do we do? Another if statement, right? P1 license. Cool, else. So what's going to go on this else here? We've said if the license is a P1 license, then arrested. So if it's not, then else the stuff here, right? So what's the next check going to be? If someone was saying, yep, if speed greater than 100. Um, so again, following down here, <clears throat> following down here, this thing here wasn't true, so that goes in the else. And then we have another question we're asking, so this becomes another if statement. If the speed is more than 100, then yes becomes this bit here. And this is another question, so we have a check, is the license a P2 license? Whoops. Um, and so if it is, if it's the yes, we go into the, the body of the if statement. Arrested. Um, else, that's going to be the no branch of this one. So all good. Have a nice. And so we've now closed off this branch here. So this came from the question, um, if the speed is more than 100, the yes branch was this sort of thing down here. So the no branch then is going to be this all good. And so that's going to go in the else for this if statement, if you can see what I mean. Does that make sense? So for this sort of outer if statement here, it's asking if the speed is more than 100. If it's not, it's going to then go to this. You can see it's the matching else statement there. And so that will also be not arrested. And then looking back at our if license is P1, we can see this closes all the way down uh, in line with this one here. So that one's been done. And then this if here, speed is more than 90, we need no, so else. Um, again, not arrested. And then we close off. Right, this closes that else there. So we are now back at the original question. No, the if the license is a learner's license. No, we've done that if we've done that else. Okay. So then. Yes, the else from the original, speed is greater than 80. No, it's not. So not arrested, have a nice day. And that was the extra code from before. OK, so how is this looking? If I make that full screen. That was not the full screen button. That was the button next to the full screen button, which was exit. My apologies. This raises an interesting question of interface design, right? Those of you who go on to become the sort of programmers who write programs, like you know, make graphical programs that people use, shh, you have choices in how you make your interfaces work, how you design them, right? And so in this case, you have a full screen button that people are going to want to use a lot, an exit viewer, exit viewer button. Like, if they want to do one of these things, they really don't want to do the other one, right? So 
is putting them really close together like this a bad idea? I mean, maybe I, ac I accidentally exited, so you know, one person in the world has had a problem from that. But what if it was like one of these buttons was, I don't know, I was going to use a different example. Like there is a, a real missile incoming. Please don't panic. You might die. Versus it's a drill. You know, go and be calm, right? So you want to have the real problem versus drill buttons being really far away. Except for when that didn't happen. Might have heard of that semi-recently. So now let's go properly full screen and let's reopen our things. Ah. Oh. Um, lecture for license blank. There we go. So looking down at this thing here, does this make sense? Can you sort of follow this flow of logic? If the speed is more than 80, then check this. Otherwise, if it's not, check this, check this, and check this, and so on. Does that sort of make sense? Kind of, sort of, yeah? No? Yes, I'm seeing a couple of nods. Cool. And so this is a really valuable way for you to, I guess, write your own statement. So when you're trying to construct, for example, an assignment that we give you that's got a complex sort of logic chain, drawing out the diagram and then turning that into the if-else can be um, a really good way of doing that. I've then got the one last semester I got tutors to then write out their versions, their implementations. I'll just show some of these really quickly, but I won't go through them in depth. I'll put them up if you want to look at them. Uh, Man, I'm sure it was one of these. Is it this one? Yeah, OK. So here are several different options. Like one of the tutors wrote it like this. Um, one of them wrote it like this. One of them wrote it like this. One of them wrote it like this. I think this is the same way as I just did it. So you can see, like, even not just reading the code, but looking at sort of the shape of it. Um, one of them wrote it like this in one line. Cool, that's not a good way to write your code. Um, and then this sort of mess, right? So I, I would like to emphasize again that this, this cutoff here is this line you can see here is how long your line should be no wider than. If your line is longer than this, then you should really try and split it across multiple lines. You shouldn't just keep going across way off the edge of the screen. So there's some you know, life advice for you. But there are lots and lots of different ways of representing the logic of solving this problem in different if statements. And I will check this if you want to look at it after on the website. So I couldn't quite hear you. Was your question, do I have a preference for which one is better? Or? So again, hard to hear. I think you said, do I think one of them is better designed or yeah. sort of a better approach? So that's a really good question. Um, like, are any of these designed better than the other ones? Are there reasons that one is way better than the other one, and so on? I think it comes down to readability, right? If you read this one, if the speed is more than the speed limit, you're arrested. Otherwise, if you've got a P2 license and your speed is more than 100, you're arrested. Like, you can just sort of read these lines, right? It's pretty clear. This one's pretty similar. It puts this sort of speed limit thing out first. Um, this one does the same thing, sort of inverted. So if the license is the learner's license, if the speed is more than 80, arrested, otherwise not. I think all of them that are quite readable that you can sort of easily read through are good in my opinion, or well designed in my opinion. This one is not because you've got to scroll off the end. Um, and this tutor intentionally wrote as much crazy mess as they could. Um, but yeah, I think the definition of like good or well defined in this case comes down to what's the easiest to read. Cool. Are there any questions about that so far? Should I try that in a different tone? Are there any questions about that so far? Cool, you either perfectly understand everything or you're not paying attention.
up to you either way, I guess. So now let's look at something completely new. Um, if statements are really cool and we can do cool stuff with them, and I'm going to look at my talk slowly so and I get excited, I'm going to talk too fast. Hold this here. So if statements are cool and we can sort of represent this logic, and that's interesting, it's useful, but there are still things that we kind of haven't worked out how to do or haven't found a good way of doing. So something you might have noticed either in previous coding experience or if you've done this week's word calculate, word addition, I think it's called, challenge exercise, um, or various other things you might have done, sometimes you find yourself copying and pasting code over and over again, like the same thing, changing it slightly. Wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to do that? Wouldn't it be nice if we could like make our code reusable, so rather than just copying this thing, we can go this piece of code, yeah, let's use it again, let's use it for this and this and this and so on. Um, it wouldn't it be nice if our main function could be really small and simple? Like the main function could literally just be three or four lines of like, get this input, get this input. If the thing is this, print out this, otherwise this. Like you can do all of the calculation, not in the main function. And making our programs nicer to read, because of course like readability is one of these things that I keep saying is really important. And it turns out, yes, we can do a thing that has all of these features um, called functions. So, how many of you in like high school math or first year math have you done that? Have seen like cos and sine, like cos sine, cosine, the mathematical things? How many of you have? How many of you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about when I say cos and sine? Okay, people up the back. So it's been a very, very, very long time for me since I did high school math, but these are like functions, like the the sine function or the cosine function. You give it an angle. And it does some calculation, gives you a different angle. I'm sure someone knows far more than me about it. Is that sort of accurate? People who know math? Cool, a couple of nods. So they're effectively things we do where we give it some input, so like a number in this case, an angle, and it gives us out a different output. And they're like a black box. It's sort of like this magical thing. We can't see what's happening in the middle of it. We just give it something and get something out. And so a really good example of what a function is in a more abstract sense is a toaster, right? What is a toaster? What, what do you give a toaster? Someone said bread. How many of you have used a toaster before? How many of you haven't used, have, how, many, how many of you haven't seen a toaster before in your life? <laughs> and how many of you are lying? <laughs> so, Toasters, right, they're these little kitchen appliances. You put in bread and it gives you... What do you get after you put the bread in? You get toast, yeah. So toasters are this machine for taking in bread and giving you out toast. What happens inside the toaster? Like, who knows, there's some heat and toasting stuff going on. We don't care how it works. We just know that we put, to we put bread in and we get toast out. And you could buy a new toaster like from Kmart, right? And if your toaster breaks, buy a different toaster. It'll still toast bread. It's still this thing that does what it says it does. Takes in some input and gives you an output. And importantly, for the same input, you always get the same output. Like if I put bread in my toaster, I'm not going to get cake out one day by surprise. Like it follows the rules of the toaster, takes bread, gives you toast. And you've actually seen these inside programming already as well. Like printf is a function. What do we give it? What does it give us out? A little bit more confusing. Scanf, also a function. And I mean, the main function, right? We call it in main, the main function, functions in the name. And these are all things where we give them some sort of input, and they give us something back. Um, so in terms of printf, is that on my next slide? No. So printf, for example, we give it like, hello world, and it'll print out hello world for us. And if we printf hello world again a second time, it'll still do the same thing as it did before. It'll print out Hello World the same again. And aside from being a good way of making toast, functions are a good way of, uh, of achieving what we call abstraction. Um, and abstraction is sort of one of the most important things in computer science, really. Like everything sort of comes back to it. It's about I'm looking at these words and it's completely throwing me off my train of thought. It's sort of about breaking problems down into smaller problems, um, 
making sort of little individual things which can be used to do something and who you, the inner details are hidden from the outside. So, for example, breaking your initial problem down into some smaller problems and some smaller problems. Each of those little really easy problems, for example, one of them might be ask someone for their name, for their age, and scan it in. So you could have one blob that'll do this. It'll print out what's your age. It'll scan in a number. It'll return that number. And then that's sort of this nice little blob. It does exactly one thing. And then we can just call that from, or we can use that in our larger piece of code. And so rather than having to see how all that works, we can just say, do this thing. Um, and so that's one of the things functions allow us to like separate out, or we'd call like encapsulate a piece of code serving a single purpose. So we take something that does just one thing, and we put it in this function over here. Um, another thing, they let us test and verify a piece of code. So those of you, I mean, hopefully, how many of you have not written a program yet in this course? Nobody, right? OK, cool. So how many of you have written a program that didn't have any bugs in it? The first time you wrote the program, it was perfect. It had no bugs anywhere. OK, you're raising your hand. How do you know it was perfect? You tested it. How do you know your tests were perfect? So how do you know that the tests you made were perfect if you tested it? You don't know, right? Like you can say, oh, my program works because it passes auto test, but how do you know auto test is correct, right? You basically have probably never written a program that was completely correct everywhere in all parts of it on the first go. I certainly haven't. Um, but by breaking things into functions, right, if we have a really large program, shh, so like the, the license, driving license speed one we just looked at, as a program, like, the, the whole entire thing, it does a lot of stuff. And so if we give in some uh, license type and speed, and it gives us the wrong answer, it can be hard to see what's going wrong. But if we've broken it up into like the smallest possible chunks we can, we can check each of these individually. And you'll find, um, if you do sort of follow on computing courses, I know operating systems was one really fantastic course. You know, I loved it a lot. Assignments were pretty hard, and I had so many bugs in my code, like it was just, Everything was a mission of what's wrong in my code. Something's wrong, it's not working. What's wrong, I don't know. But if you can make things be these tiny little, you know, thing, tiny little functions, I guess, that will do just one thing, you can check, if I give it this input, does it give me this output? And so it's much easier to check that each of these things individually does it right, rather than checking that your entire code works at once. Um, we can also reuse code, so if we, uh, what's a good example? But basically, whenever you would be copying and pasting code multiple times in your code, you can usually reuse it with a function instead. Um, and they can make our programs shorter, uh, which can make them easier to modify and debug. So this is an interesting thing. Are shorter programs good? Is it, if your program is shorter, if your code is shorter, is it better? Someone said yes. Someone else said yes. If your code is the absolutely shortest possible code to do a certain thing, does that mean it's the best code? Someone said no. I think it's not. Um, I think you want to short on your programs and that you kind of remove duplication. So you don't want to be doing the same thing a million times. But you don't want to make your code so short that it's like ridiculously and unusably short. Um, in the break, I'll show you a really cool thing. Remind me to show you a really cool thing in the break about short code. I don't know what that means. Um, and so functions in C, in terms of how they look, they have these four things. First of all, they have a return type. So when you have your toaster, you put the bread in and it returns toast. So for a toaster, the return type would be toast. Um, for, you know, cos and sine, the return type is a number. The function needs a name. So for example, add numbers, if you're going to have a function that add numbers. You then give it the parameters, which are the things that the function takes in. So for example, if it's going to add two numbers together, it's going to take num1 and num2. Um, and then, so this is also sort of missing the other step of the function, which is the stuff inside the function, the contents. But then at the end of the function, we have the return statement, which says this is the output that you give back. So this is the name of the function we have. It's going to add numbers together. These are the things it takes in, num1 and num2. It gives us back something of type int, 
And in this case, it gives us back this thing called sum. Cool. Does that make sense so far? OK. I propose. Let's try it. Let's see if this code does actually do what I say it does. Um, and then after that, we will take a break. So let's put it into full screen and not exit. Very good. Um, you know, that's going to be very slow. I'll just type it out by hand. Okay, so what does my code have to start with always, every time? Had a comment? Yes, correct answer, Andrew. Um, add numbers together using a function. Um, seven, cool. What do we need next? Hash includes. Why do we have stereo.h? Something f and something else f. Print f and scan f, yes. Uh, what do we have next? Our main function. See, it's a, it's a function. It's called name. It returns an int, a thing of type int. Takes in void, whatever that means. And then at the bottom, it has the return statement, return zero. Um, let's chuck this in. Yeah. Cool. And so I want to write my code. Normally, we put our code in here, right? But because I'm writing a function, the function is a separate thing to the main function. So it'll go outside of the main function, just down below. So I think it was called add numbers. So I want to make sure I get it exactly right. What a good question. Does it matter if it's above or below the main function? Yes, it does. Remind me of that question in a few minutes. We will be talking about that very soon. Um, int sum equals num1 plus num2. Cool. So aside from making a typo in every single word I typed, does this sort of make sense? At a high level, we have this thing here, and we're going to give it two numbers, and it's going to give us out what the numbers are when we add them together. Cool. Questions, comments, confusions thus far? OK, I have a question for you. How do we actually use this function? How do we actually add numbers together? Because it's, it's like we've bought a toaster, but we haven't actually plugged it in or put any toast in it yet. So. Someone said create a toaster. So yeah, I need to like use my toaster, right? Let's, let's look at another function. Let's say printf, uh, I like toast. So I said printf was a function, right? And this is me doing what's called calling the function. So when we say we call the function, we go to the function, give it some input, and get some output back. So in this case, we're giving printf the input, I like toast. So then, how do we call our add numbers function? Let's take the printf and then just change the name and go from there. So, does add numbers take in like some words? Take some numbers, right? So let's give it some numbers. Let's go three plus four. So, let me try that again. Let's go three and four. So what we're doing here is we're saying, call the add numbers function, like how we'd say call the printf function, and give it two things, the number three and the number four. So when this runs, it's going to be calling this. It's going to go, ah, oh, num1 is three. Num2 is four. It's then going to do in sum is num1 plus num2, and return sum. So this is sort of equivalent. We could replace this line here with this line here, three plus four. And it would do the same thing, because it's a pretty boring function for now. Cool. Does this make sense so far? So what is this program going to do? 
I'm going to run the program. What am I going to see? Any ideas? Functions, functions. See. Ah. Let's ignore that for now. That'll be the answer to your question. Oh, I was, wasn't going to hit enter, I'm sorry. I spoiled the surprise and hit enter. So what's going to happen when I hit enter on this to call the functions program? It's going to print out I like toast, and it's going to add three and four together. But there's like no seven anywhere, right? So has it actually add, added the numbers together? Yes, no, maybe. Like, why have they not printed out? Yeah, because I didn't print them out. Um, I need to print out some number. I'll say, give me a sum. Print that out here. Cool. So hopefully this makes sense. This is equivalent to just writing sum equals 3 plus 4 for now. And then print out the sum. And so now if I compile it and ignore that message, and I run functions, it's going to say I like toast. And then print out what add numbers has given us. Let me chuck that over there. So we've called add numbers. We've given it, hey, here's three and here's four. It's given us back out a number. And that number was seven. So three plus four is seven. Cool. Our computer can add numbers. Good work. Are there any questions before we have a break? Yes. Say that again. Yes. Yes. OK, so I was getting a warning when I tried compiling it, saying like something bad is happening. And I said, oh, let's ignore that for now. But the program still worked. This is because when you get a warning when you compile your code, it just means something bad is going on. But it's not like something bad is going on and the world is ending. So it still can make a program from your code. It's just sort of got to guess what to do in certain things that are unclear. You should never ignore warnings in the code that you compile unless you're doing a lecture demonstration where you're intentionally ignoring it. Um, if you get a warning, it means you have a bug in your code, and it'll help you find it. As for why we're getting that and how to fix it, we will see that after the break. Are there any more questions? Yeah. Hang on, hang on. Lots of people. Person at the back. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, can you say that again? Could I have the... Oh, yeah, could I print that out in the add function? Uh, I think so. So the question was, can I print this out in the add function itself? And the answer is yes. So the thing that I put inside this function here is now happening we can see this has happened before this printf here. Cool. Good question. Was there another question down here somewhere? Yes. Um, why do I need this in the main function? As in, why do I need the word int? Um, good question. Let's talk about that more after the break. Um, any other questions? Yes. What a good question. Is the variable sum in the main function the same as the variable sum in the add function? I mean, they have the same value. We've established that. But good question. Let's look at that after the break. I'm sorry it's such a boring answer. But any other questions? OK, so let's take a break. And then I will answer all of your questions afterwards. Um, I'll set a timer for 10 minutes. Have an exactly 10 minute break. Get a drink, jump up and down, all those good things. So let's turn that beeping off and turn this microphone on. OK, cool. Hello again, everybody. I see that basically everybody is back. Good work. I hope that you had a break. How many of you just sat down for the whole break and didn't like stand up or move around or anything? You guys, please, next break, just stand up and sit down a couple of times. 
It's really boring to sit still and listen to the lecturer talk for two hours. So breaks are very important. Very important for your learning. So I had... This sounds quieter than it was before. How's that? Is that a good volume? A bad volume? Is it so quiet that no one can hear me and so no one said anything? Um, so a lot of people asked me during the break, like, hey, I tried doing this on my computer and I got this weird error. That's the weird error that I didn't show you intentionally that I'm going to show you about now. Um, cool. And one other thing. So in terms of doing work on your own computers, like use VLab, it's great. But VLab isn't the only option. You can also, there aren't Linux instructions yet. You can also like install a compiler on your own computer or edit files on your own computer and transfer them to CSE. VLab is fantastic and great, but there are, are other options. This has information for Windows and Mac, post on the forum to ask questions for that sort of thing. Use VLab, it's great, but don't use VLab if it's using up your battery life. Cool. Um, what's next on my lecture slides? So I will delete this stuff that I wrote during the break. Can someone smell toast? I'm really hungry and I can smell like toast. Can, can you smell toast as well? Yeah, see, it's not just me. Maybe the, the students in Matthews B have toast. There's another lecture stream in Matthews B. Clearly you guys should have brought, brought a toaster. Um, so back to the computer things. Shh. Computer things, yes, not toast computers. So two really good questions. I might start with, I'll start with this one. So somebody asked during the break, like, why do we have return sum? What does that mean? And so the answer to that is, like, looking at our function again, the function is called add numbers. It takes in two numbers, num1 and num2. Cool, we've got that bit done. Like a toaster takes in one piece of bread. And then the return is the part where it's giving a value back to whoever's calling it. So let me implement a toaster, for example. Right, so I've got um, a toaster. It's called toaster. It takes in uh, a thing of type bread. I would call it a slice, like a slice of bread. It returns toast. Right, and so in here, do secret things to turn bread into toast. Um, and then maybe I'll say like toast equals, I'll say burn bread, right? So in my you know, very silly conceptual example, let's say we have a toaster that just always burns bread and says that's toast. So this is what a toaster would look, at, look like as a function. It's got a name, it's called toaster. Return something of type toast, and it takes in a thing of type bread called a slice, so a slice of bread. Um, it's gonna do something inside the function. In this case, it's just gonna burn the bread. And then it's gonna return the toast to us. And so this return line here, is it saying, okay, here's the thing that I've done in the function, take it back, this is your thing to, to deal with now. So whoever it was that asked that question, does that make sense? Was anybody confused before and is now less confused? Was anybody confused before and is now more confused? Okay, I think it's, it's equal numbers. I think that's not a net gain. Someone said something. Yes, the toaster thing again. Cool, yes, I can. So, um, I would draw a diagram, but I can't draw, like I can do boxes and arrows, but I can't draw toasters or toast. So I'll just chuck some comments in instead. A toaster is a thing that takes in bread and gives back toast. Cool, and so, we sort of have like return type name input. So here is a extremely more confusing kind of breakdown of these things. 
We have the return type, so the sort of thing that it gives back, which is going to be toast for a toaster. Um, the name, which is toaster, it's just called toaster. And then whatever inputs it's going to take in, so like a, a slice of bread. Uh, it does whatever it has to do to make go from one thing to the other in here. So like, you know, it's a logic here. Maybe it turns on the toasting irons and does this and has a timer and whatever. Maybe it just burns the bread. And then once it's finished doing stuff, once it's finished doing all the calculations inside the function, the return toast, this line here means the thing that you've made in here, which in this case is a toast, that's, it's confusing because I've got a type toast. Um, let's, let's just go with it. It's not valid C. It's a toaster. I guess that's why. Um, but this return toast is saying, I have a thing in this function called toast, and I'm giving it back to you. Where was the person who asked the question down there? So does that make sense? Like it's, this line here is like return toast, like the, the bread popping up, right? It's going, I finished doing all the work inside the toaster, and now I'm going to give you back the thing that I have, which in this case is the toast, or in this case was the sum of the numbers. Cool. Question. What if you did not return some there? So if I just didn't have this line? Cool. So the question was, what happens if I just don't return sum, so I don't have this line? The answer is nothing. Like, we're doing the calculation inside the function, but we're not giving the result back. So it would be like our toaster takes in bread, and then the bread just vanishes, right? We don't get any bread back. We don't get the, the sum back in this case. Um, it'll probably complain and give you a, an error saying that you need to return something. You have to give something back. But if it doesn't give you that error, then it'll just do nothing. Does that make sense? You're looking confused still. Cool. Other questions? Yes. Why can't I declare my function? In the main function. Well, so the question is why can't I declare my function in the main function? I'm guessing you mean like doing this? Um, I'm going to lie to you, and I'm sorry. I don't like lying to people. You can't. It's not a thing you can do. It's the rules of C don't let you. Um, the answer is you can for some reason. It's weird. Like You shouldn't be able to make a function inside a function. Um, I'm going to go with you can't do this. It will actually work maybe sometimes, and it'll be really confusing, and your tutor will go like, that was my face for like five minutes after the student had this in their code. I was like, what? So um, why can't you? Because it's against the rules, because it doesn't work, even though it kind of does. Thank you, boost delivery person. See, tutors are great. Um, does that answer your question, person over there? Cool. Were there more questions? Yes. Why am I saying it's against the rules? That is a really long question that I don't think I can answer in the space of an hour. I'll have a go at a short version. So there are many different sets of rules for what is valid C. Um, it's against some of the rules of some Cs, but some other rules do let it work. If that was confusing, that's fine. Ignore what I said. But it's the sort of thing that I think is a bad idea in general. It doesn't make your code any better. It just makes things more confusing. It has limitations that you might discover later on if you play with it more. So it's like it's technically possible it will work sometimes in some cases, except it won't always work and it won't do what you expect it to do. Does that answer your question, whoever had the question? Somewhere around here? Yes, cool. Other question? Person I can't see? I have not. That's a very good question. I was going to talk about that now. So the, the question was, and sort of a combined question of many people, like why does this go after this bit here? Why doesn't it go before? What's the error that you were getting before and you didn't have this going on? Um, and let's, let's look at that error that we did get when I was pretending there was no error. Ah, uh, well, unknown type name, toast. I don't know what's wrong with C. I know what toast is. Like, come on, 
get on my level. No, I can't make this bigger. There we go, I can't make this bigger. Okay, well, I know what toast is, so you're just stupid. See, that's okay. I'll comment this out. C is a lovely language. I didn't mean to call you stupid. So let's see the actual warning that we had before. Okay. I'm going to make this full screen and I'm going to zoom out a bit just to sort of show you. So on your screen, it'll look more like this. Um, so I can show you all the ones and then I'll sort of zoom in. So you get an error message. Can you sort of see, you can't read the words, but can you see there's like a white line and then some gray stuff? I zoom in a little bit more. This is like a white line which is saying this is the problem you're getting and then this is gray explaining what the problem is. Um, we've got two problems here. That one I think I added by mistake. But this one here it's saying implicit declaration of function add numbers is invalid in C99. Um, have I mentioned yet that error messages and warnings are really confusing and trying to understand them is like an art form? One person sort of waved their hand. Oh, you're waving it. Come on, guys, what are, what are you doing? Making friends in the lectures? Shouldn't be doing that. Um, what are you? Here to learn. You're not here to meet friends and experience interesting things. Just got to, I don't know. I don't know. Um, error messages are confusing and very hard to understand. And sometimes they're not, but a lot of the time they are. And if you find yourself confused by an error message, that's OK. Probably everybody else is too. In general, I'd say like Google it and see if someone on the internet knows. But in this case, I do know what it means. And what it's saying is, translated to like English words, um, oh, let's even got it there. The compiler doesn't recognize what add numbers means. And so you can see down here in my add numbers function, um, I have my main function where stuff happens. And then afterwards, I've said, here's the add numbers function. And so when the compiler compiles the code, um, it goes sort of top to bottom, right? So it's going to start here. It's going to go, oh, cool, main function. Oh, that is printf I like toast. Oh, yeah, I know how to turn that into code. In sum equals add numbers. Oh, yeah, I know how to make an int. Hang on, what? what's add numbers? I haven't heard of add numbers before. Mm, OK, let's just, just go with it. Printf, oh, I know what that means. Return zero. Cool. Um, it gets confused because it doesn't know what add numbers is yet. And then we tell it later on, oh, this is add numbers. And so it works out in the scheme of things because it's there later on and it's OK. But the compiler has no idea what's going on, basically. There are two ways we can fix this. What's the obvious way that we can fix this? Yeah, move it up the top. Wish that is so cool. Um, is that not the coolest thing ever? I think it's the coolest thing ever. So we could do this. We could put it up the top. And now when we run it, all is good. No errors. Social functions. I like Toast 7. Cool. But I said there are two ways. Um, which means that maybe this is not the best way of doing it. And this is not the best way of doing it. I sort of, yep, OK, I said that already. Um, with our code, the main function should be the first thing at the top, because it's the main thing. That's the thing that happens first in your code, right? The hu we write our C for humans to read. So the humans at the top see the main function and goes, OK, that's what the program is doing. But the compiler doesn't know about the function because it happens later on, right? So we need to tell it about that function beforehand. And we effectively do this by like giving it the function but without the actual code inside the function. So we give it what's called a function prototype, which is this thing here. And you can see I've literally just copied this first line here. So that's saying it returns an int. It's called add numbers. It takes in an int number one and int number two. And I've just chucked it up the top here. So it's like saying, hey, by the way, later on, I'm going to give you this function. But here's how it works for now. Right? So the compiler doesn't have to know how the function actually does the computation. It just needs to know that it exists. And it takes in these things and gives us back this thing. Does this make sense? Have a think about this for 30 seconds while I drink. Are there any, <clears throat> let me try again. Are there any questions? Yes. <coughs> Hang on, sorry. Say that again. Do I need to put the two inputs in there when I declare the code? So I pretty much do, because otherwise it doesn't know what the input is. Because it needs to check that our code is valid code. And so did I say the question? The question was, do we need to give it 
50 two inputs as well on this thing in the prototype. Yes, we do, because it needs to make sure our code is valid code. And so when we have this here, it needs to know, hey, it's giving in two numbers. So it expects two numbers. Does that make sense? Um, yes. Why is it? Why is the second what? Why do we have this one here and this one down here, do you mean? Cool. I just said that, man. Why aren't you paying attention? So to, to recap again, we have the main function should be like the first thing in our code, the first code we see in our code. Because it's the main thing. It's the first thing that happens when the program runs. But we need to tell the compiler when it's making it into computer code, hey, later on, we've got a function called add numbers, and here's how it works. Like, here's the input it takes and the output it gives. So then when it sees add numbers used in the main function, it goes, oh, cool. You're calling add numbers. I know that that's meant to take in two numbers and meant to give back one number. And so it knows, cool, or good, we're happy. And then down here, we actually have the implementation for the function, we call it. So the, the way that the function works. Does that make sense? Why is this below this one? Um, and so the reason for that is because we want the first code to be the main function. If we had like a really complicated program, for example, let's pretend that this is actually different code. When we look at this file here, we go, OK, there's a function called this. Maybe there's like a whole bunch of functions. You know, later on, we will see all of these functions, which pretend they have different names. And then here's the main function, so we can see this is what the code is doing. Um, if the program were instead structured like this, um, we would have to scroll past all of this stuff here before we actually got to the main function. So we wouldn't know what the code is doing until we got all the way to the end. So it's sort of like making it be more readable for the people reading it. Let's reset that. Actually, let's save that as readable. Cool. Good question. Are there any other questions? I didn't hear the second thing you said. Uh, that cause any problems? Will that cause any problems? I will talk about this in a moment. Are there any other questions about the other stuff first? Yes. Pretty much the same question as that. I'll answer that in a moment. Any other questions? Say that again. Ah, oh, I forgot. Thank you for reminding me, but you reminded me too late. Remind me at the end. Remind me before the end, please. I'll give you a quick spoiler now. So there's this thing called the obfuscated C coding competition. And they try to write programs in the most confusing and compact and short way possible. There's crazy things. There's cool things, and it's amazing, and they're really short, and you should never write that code in reality. I will show you after the second half of the lecture. Cool. Were there other questions? So let me now answer the question of, like, are these two sums the same thing? So remember how I said that functions are like black boxes and you don't need to know what's going on inside? Does that, that sound familiar? Functions, black boxes, toasters, you're listening? Maybe some of you are. So this function here, the things that happen in this function stay in this function. Like the main function doesn't know anything about how it works on the inside because it's like a secret black box, right? So to everything else in the program, it has no idea about this stuff. Because all it knows is that add numbers exists, and it says it adds numbers, but not how it works. And so it's fine to have this and this, because int main doesn't know about how this works. And add numbers doesn't know about how this works. They just sort of know that you know, there's a function called main, and it's got some stuff on the inside. But this is sort of completely unrelated and irrelevant to the addNumbers function. 
Does that make sense? Everybody who had that question, does that sort of make sense? Okay. We call that scope, by the way. Like the scope of a function is, what? Well, yeah, the. It's called scope. Let's let's go with that. I'll explain it better later on if you need. Um, I just overwrote the thing called read. Whatever. I'll fix that later on. Um, was there another question that I didn't answer? The function prototypes are something. I'll assume that it was, and then try again later. So, like we have now seen, return type gives us like a number, function name, add numbers, parameters, the things it takes in, two numbers, um, the stuff inside the function, and then the return statement, so the thing it's going to give back. So, you might have seen in int main, right? It's int main void. And what does that mean? Like void, what does void mean? Like in English, it's like an, an empty, like a nothingness sort of, you know, the, the void where nothing is. So it literally in programming just means there are no parameters taken in here. So this function, get random number, returns an int, but takes no input. And so if you wanted a function to give you a random number, you could call this one here. Um, and it had just returned four. You know, someone rolled a dice, dice said four. Here's your function, get a random number. So this doesn't take in any input. Like everything it does, it sort of knows about already. But then it gives us back a number. Does that make sense? I saw one person nodding, but I don't think they're paying attention to me. Um, and then functions with no return value. We can also have functions that don't return anything. Um, in this case, a function that prints out five, I can't say this word, ast asterisks, five stars. Um, this function doesn't need to return anything. Like, we're not giving it any input or taking any output. It just, it does something. It prints out these stars, but it's not kind of giving us anything back to the program itself. So I said before that we have to have a return something. If our function returns an int, for example, it has to return an int. But if it doesn't return anything, we can make it be a void function, which means it just has no return. So void inside the circle brackets that takes no input. And void as the type here gives no output. All good so far? Question? Say that again. I have main. Main is an int, did you say? So like when would the void not be void, do you mean, or? <laughs> cool, that is a good question that I will very briefly answer. So you might see in some of the code that I have that I haven't changed for the semester, So you might see um, this semester we're just using void in here, but in code that I haven't changed for this semester, you might see this intag c trust argv bracket bracket thing. When we have this here, main can take input. Where does it take input from? That's a good question. Go and think about it. If you want to know, look it up. Very interesting question. But in this case, our main doesn't take any input. Like. We might have scanfs and stuff in here. We might scan values in. But when we call the main function, we don't give it any input. Um, it's basically completely irrelevant which of these ones you use, unless you're doing some stuff later on with terminals. Does that sort of satisfactorily not really answer your question? Cool. More questions? OK, so um, I said before, in order to use a function, we have to tell the compiler, first of all, you will find this function later on. Like, there exists a function called add numbers. You know, later on, I'll tell you how it works. But for now, the function exists. And this is called a function prototype. There we go. Tells the compiler that it exists and the structure it has. And it includes the key information. Like, the important information about this function is in the prototype. So 
the compiler, when it's compiling your program, it checks that your program like follows the rules, right? Because if your program isn't a valid C program, then how does it turn it into a program for the computer, right? It can't because it doesn't follow the C rules. And so the compiler needs to know when you call the add numbers function, are you calling it with the right input and expecting the right output? So if I had Yeah, I'll put this one back over here. So in my add numbers run from before, if I tried to call the add numbers function with just three, right? So our add numbers function wants two numbers. But if I try and just give it one number, the compiler's gonna go like, hey, what are you doing, Andrew? You can't do that. Ah, I need to give it a function prototype first. See, I haven't given it a prototype, so it doesn't know that I can't do that. What happens if I run it, though? What do you think's gonna happen? Three. Oh, that's really disappointing. I bet GCC wouldn't have done that. GCC did that. Oh, well. So it doesn't know how it works, which didn't end up being a problem for some reason here. But when I do tell it how it works, <coughs> I like this, so I say, hey, add numbers, you see later on, function prototype, blah, blah, blah. Uh, too few arguments to function call, expected to have one. So it's saying, add numbers, takes in two numbers, and you've given me one number, like that's, that's not enough. Um, and so it's important that we tell it what the function should look like, how it input it takes, output it gives, so that it knows when it gets to that code in like the main function, for example, whether it's right or not. Um, does that make sense? Hopefully. Um, so I guess some things worth pointing out. Um, a function can have zero or more parameters. So that was the things inside the brackets that it takes as input. Those are called the parameters, the things that we pass into the function. It can have zero or more, like zero, one, two, three, as many as you can be bothered typing. I don't think there's a limit. The tutors aren't listening, so they can't know, tell me if there's a limit. But it can only return zero or one values. It can return nothing, or it can return one thing. Shh. I just said something profound, and you missed it. Um, so it's worth, even though it can take zero or more parameters of input, it can only give nothing or one type of output. So we couldn't, for example, have our add numbers function return two ints. It can only return the one int. That's just the rules of how functions work. Um, yeah, sure, let's talk about this. So when we call a function, it has a copy of the parameters that are passed in. So what that actually means is if we had something like this, right, we said, um, num1 equals num1 plus 100. This is a thing you can do, by the way. Um, you can make your value be like equal to itself plus 100, and this will add 100 to num1. So looking at this function, we make our sum, num1 plus num2. We then say num1 equals num1 plus 100. I should probably do that the other way around. So we add 100 to num1, we then sum them up, and then we return that sum. So if I give this three and seven, for, or three and five from before, what will this give me back as output? If it's gonna add 100 to the three, it'll have 103, right? Plus five is 107. So in theory, this will give us 107. 108. Oh, three and five is eight, not seven. Why didn't you guys correct me on that? Come on. You should be good at math. As you can see, you don't need to be good at math to be good at programming. Just in case you're terrible at math and you're feeling bad. Don't feel bad. So anyway, it adds the numbers three and five, but also the 100 that we've added on here, right? So in this function, num1 has increased. I didn't even pass them as variables here. Let me do this here. So rather than just putting the three and five in here, right, I could have put in 
names of some variables, and I could call these whatever I want. I could call them A and B, except that then I'm going to be a bad person. I do it anyway. So when I call this function right, I'm saying add the numbers A and B. And A is a variable with 3, and B is a variable with 5 in it. Shh, it's nearly over. So I've got a variable with 3, a variable with 5. I give them to the add numbers function. It gives me the sum back. And then I print that out. Someone keeps saying sum. I'll, I'll just go with it. So it does indeed do what we thought. It gives us back 108. But if I print out the numbers, right, if I print out what A and B are, we can see that they haven't changed. So even though inside our add numbers function we changed num1, so we changed this thing that was passed in here, which was A, for example. It changed in this function, but it didn't change in the main function. So in the main function, the numbers were still the same as they started out as. Question. Say that again, Lada. Is that because they gave it different names? What a good question. You know how I talked before about how what happens inside a function stays in a function and doesn't matter to the outside world? What do you think? Do the names matter? I didn't quite hear what you said, but it sounded like I'm confused. It seems like uh, the names don't matter. Yes, uh, the names don't matter. Yes, very good question. So the question was, like, if I'd called this num1 and num2 here, would that make a difference because these ones are called num1 and num2? And the answer is no, because what happens in here matters to this function. Even if the variables are called the same thing out here, they're not going to affect each other. Yes? Can you have two? Ah, uh, sort of. You can return only one thing, but you could return twice if you wanted to return different things. I don't actually want to say that you can do that. So you could sort of say like num1 I don't know, if for some reason you wanted to make the sum be 0 if num1 was 0 you could do this here and then if this is true it would do this um, We call these multiple returns, and they're a bad idea. That didn't sound very convincing. What we could instead do is change sum and then return it down here. Are you still extremely confused? OK. <coughs> How do you close it to what? Right, so shh, I can see people are running off. If you have to run off, that's fine. I will answer this question. I think there was another question, and then we'll be over. So the question was, we had the uh, print star thing, which took in no input and gave no output. Um, uh, star, star. So given that this takes no input and gives no output, how do we call it? The answer to that is we just call it and don't give it anything. So just like that. We don't put anything in the brackets for what we're giving it, because we're giving it nothing. Cool. Any final questions? Yes. We don't talk about that in this course. That's a bad thing to do. Happy to talk about that later, but not part of the course. OK, well, it sounds like you're leaving. So I guess if you're going to leave, that's fine. You could do this like halfway through and then end the lecture early. That would be clever. What's your question? Hang on. Shh. Sorry, I still didn't hear that. 
with the prototype above main, yes? Can you have different names here compared to down here? Is that the question? Um, shh. Two more minutes. So the question was, do the names that I have up here for my add numbers prototype have to be the same as the ones down here? The answer is no, they don't. It just needs to know that they're ints. So we could call them terrible variable names like that, right? They can be different variable names. They just have to both be ints. But of course, if I call them this, then in here I need to use this name. So whatever name I have in here is the name that they will have inside here. Cool, I got a thumbs up. So I think that's probably it. Ah, ah, I'm not gonna forget this time. I'm not gonna forget this time. I forgot last time. Wish. Um, I made another feedback thing for this week. Thank you so much to everybody who gave me feedback. There were like 60, 70 of you. I hope I've done better this week. If I've done worse, if I've done better, if you have anything else to say, Please fill this out, there's a QR code, there's a link, It'll put, I'll put it on the course website, but feedback please, yes, thank you. Um, people with questions, come talk to me now, all good.